everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future of cryptography management. And while people are joining, um, I'm here today with my two colleagues from Sandbox EQ. Uh, we have Graham Steele, who is our head of product for our security product, as well as Mark Manzano, who is the senior director of engineering at Sandbox. And today we're going to talk about one of our recently launched products called the Sandbox EQ Security Suite. And we're going to tell you more about what it does, uh, how customers are currently using it, what they like about it, and we're even going to give you a sneak peek into what it looks like. Uh, we're also going to have plenty of time for Q&A, so please use the chat box to put in all of your questions, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the time that we have here today live. So I will be moderating uh, this discussion, uh, and my name is Nadia Carlston. I'm VP of Product at Sandbox. I'm responsible for managing our different product divisions across the Sandbox, and we currently have four different product areas. The first one is quantum sensing, and we are doing that to enable customers to navigate even without GPS. We also use quantum sensing for better magnetometry for our medical imaging. We have a third area, which is quantum simulation for computational chemistry. And last but not least, we have products uh, that help customers tackle security challenges, including better management of cryptography and encryption, which is what we're here to talk about today. So Mark and Graham, uh, thanks for joining me today. And Mark, I'll turn to you first and ask you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Nadia. Um... Hi, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for for making the time to come and, and listen uh, the, the this discussion about uh, the security suite that we that we have just released. My name is Mark, and as Nadia said, um, I'm the senior director in the engineering department within the quantum security group at Sandbox IQ. I came to Sandbox a couple of years ago when we were still incubating within Alphabet. Um, to, to work in the quantum security area. And my background is in cryptography engineering. I've been working during my professional uh, life in, in different areas within cryptography engineering, but always within, within the same area. Nice to be here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and Graham, uh, please, same thing, introduce yourself. Thanks, Nadia. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Graham Steele. I am the head of product here in the security group, the quantum security group here uh, in Sandbox AQ. So I also have a technical background, uh, have a PhD in cryptography. Uh, I did about 10 years of postdoctoral research in academia uh, before stepping out to uh, start a company called CryptoSense uh, that was acquired by Sandbox. And now I run the product strategy around uh, all of what we do uh, in cryptography management. Uh, within the team, and it's great to be here. All right, thanks, Graham. And so you have this really interesting experience where you were a founder of a company doing cryptography management, and now, of course, you're you're at Sandbox uh, through through the acquisition. Um, tell us a little bit more about about that journey and uh, how how the work has has changed and how you're thinking about the product these days. Yeah, great, great questions. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole lot we could go into there. But just on, on the product side, I mean, I guess the, the reason that our companies got together so easily was that we both realized that our uh, customers were struggling to get visibility at a, a global kind of enterprise wide scale of the places that they were using encryption technology, uh, signature technology, everything around uh, cryptography. Uh, and that's really important both for compliance, for getting things right today and also for getting ready for migration to uh, a future where there are quantum computers around which can break today's uh, cryptography. And fortunately, the way that we've gone at looking at the problem of how do we get visibility on all this cryptography that's in use between us and the team uh, working with Mark at Sandbox was completely complementary. Right? So in our way, we were looking at uh, applications, the way applications call cryptogra cryptographic libraries to protect data, uh, and also at cryptographic artifacts that are uh, in files and file systems. Uh, and meantime, Mark's team was investigating the problem from looking at uh, network traffic, right? So looking at a network exchange and figuring out what cryptography was used in that exchange. And it turns out you need all three of these, right? To do a really good cryptography inventory. 
Uh, and so when we was talking to each other in the context of this, uh, you know, kind of strategic uh, partnership, and we realized that we had these these really complementary technologies, uh, that was actually a really big step in, in figuring out how we were going to get the companies together and take that next step uh, along the road in, in developing this product. Uh, and as we're going to go into it with a little bit more uh, depth today, uh, being able to do all those three things actually creates a really powerful solution to the problem uh, of figuring out crypt cryptography inventory at scale uh, in a really large enterprise. Yeah, I mean, I really love that approach of really thinking about the, the customer and all their different needs around cryptography, right? Because it's not just a network, it's not just endpoints there. They really want a, a full solution and they want all of those tools to be to be integrated. Um, and, and Mark, I know that's something that you were thinking about for a very long time um, at, at Sandbox, even before I joined uh, the, the team. So um, to tell us a little bit more about your vision for the security suite, how you think about it. Um, yeah, sure. So the, the way that we look at, uh, at this product is um, as a end-to-end -to -end tool that is aimed at helping organizations modernize the way that cryptography is managed nowadays. Uh, by by talking to a lot of customers, uh, we we realized that this is uh, actually the, the one of the main uh, areas uh, of, of focus when when dealing with cryptographic vulnerabilities in in a large organization. Com companies or customers don't don't really know where to start. It's uh, typically a user. Uh, uh, um, a manual process that that is uh, error prone at some point. So uh, we've been building the security suite with the aim of actually tackling the entire uh, problem. First, uh, by bringing visibility to what's being uh, used in a given infrastructure. And second, by giving a remediation, a solution to any potential uh, findings that the visibility models uh, identify. And, and that visibility, I think it's uh, it, it's really key for, for for a lot of customers, right? And and some customers also talk about observability uh, and, and and visibility as well. So maybe tell me a little bit more about that. What what is it about observability that that is so beneficial to so many customers? Uh, yeah, so you're you're totally right. Uh, it's uh, so the observability piece. It's key for the customers, and it's also the way to start looking at at how to tackle this uh, cryptographic management modernization uh, item. Um, it's, it's all about trying to identify and categorize and store in a, in a easy to, to monitor format all sorts of cryptographic usage that you might end up having in your infrastructure. Uh, and cryptography is uh, ubiquitous nowadays. We can find it in, in a lot of places. Um, so far, what we are looking at is at finding cryptography uh, usages in applications and source code. That's extremely valuable for some of our customers that have uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, internally developed applications that um, should or that could benefit from actually these, these features. Um, we also look at cryptographic usage or cryptographic material within file systems, virtual machines, or operating systems in general. And then third, uh, which is related to what Graham was mentioning before, uh, and that gives us a, a really nice kind of complete view for now on what we are uh, aiming, um, aiming for, is network traffic. So we, we can plug our probes in order to get visibility on what kind of cryptographic algorithms, cipher suites, and protocols uh, are also being used live in a given infrastructure. Hmm. So, so that's really interesting. So how do these users, uh, from a tactical standpoint, how do they see all of this? What, what, so what's their day-to-day -day like of uh, looking at these issues? Yeah, good question. Uh, cryptography is, is scary, and that's maybe one of the main reasons why it's been hard to modernize in, in the last couple of decades. Um, so we we think that um, it, uh, having an easy to manage, easy, easy to understand uh, user interface, it's key in order to help bring this uh, forward in, inside an organization. 
So we are actually uh, working on a component called uh, Control Center, which is part of our security suite. And the Control Center is basically the interface uh, with which a customer is, is going to interact. And in this Control Center, uh, we are going to uh, show later uh, the uh, in, in in a demo that Graham will will do, in in this control center, uh, the the customer can actually um, see in a categorized manner cryptographic usage, and we provide there an inventory that can be used in order to monitor uh, in different snapshots what's the cryptographic usage within within a given time span. Yeah, no, that that's awesome. And and Graham, maybe tell us a little bit about. You know, from a product standpoint, what is the the benefit of having that observability and and that control center for for the customers, and what is the the value that they see? Yeah, so so there's a, a general um, movement, a kind of secular trend across cybersecurity in in trying to to automate cybersecurity processes, right? So so we're all finding it hard to recruit the people that we need, and the problem's getting more and more complex. Uh, and so there's two sides to that. Mark sp spoke about observability, so allowing the security teams in a large organization to see the cybersecurity assets that they need to work with. Uh, and there are already tools that do a great job of that for things like you know, network firewall configuration and this kind of stuff. But up until now, cryptography was kind of a blind spot. Right? There was no way that you could centrally see, until we build our control center, uh, an enterprise scale inventory of the, the cryptography uh, that, that you're using. Uh, and then you're looking to, to automate those those tasks, which are currently taking your developers and your operations people uh, a huge amount of time resolving issues with uh, non-compliant use of cryptography in your applications or misconfigured um, network protocols that are using the wrong kind of uh, ciphers or uh, fixing certificates that are in the wrong places uh, in the file system. So one of the reasons that our tool, I think, has had the success it has, and we'll talk a little bit later about the, the most um, kind of exciting customer work we're doing, we're doing right now, is because of that, that three-dimensional nature of the inventory, right? Combining the network angle, the file system angle, and the application angle just helps the, the results that we show to be more actionable. Right. Mm -hmm. So the way that we create value for the user is that our inventory allows them to very quickly uh, integrate with the processes and tools that they have to fix the issues around cryptography that we find. Right. So whether that's a, a call to a certificate management tool or whether that's just registering uh, a ticket in exactly the right place in our developers mm -hmm. uh, environment that tells them exactly what they need to fix and exactly which line of code. Really just trying to get that, that loop between finding a problem mm -hmm. and fixing a problem and getting to the, the next stage of, of a more robust uh, cryptography stance, that's really where the value gets generated when, they, when those things come together. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and you mentioned something about you know how this also makes it easier to then start fixing things or prioritizing the uh, fixes and, and then starting to implement some of those, those fixes. So Mark, back to you. But, how do customers start that next step? And, and what are some of the, the features that enable them to do that step efficiently? So uh, we, uh, we're we actually building a set of modules uh, that we're referring to as the remediation modules. And uh, the objective of, of these modules is to remediate any findings that the, uh, the discovery or observability modules might be uh, finding and that might be highlighted in the control center. Uh, and uh, the idea is to, to, to remediate any of these findings um, with uh, any, any of the modules that we're doing on the remediation side. Uh, one, of, one of the key characteristics of the remediation modules is that they are being built on top of uh, our cryptographic agility frameworks and our technology stack. And this means that they can end up leveraging different cryptographic uh, libraries or providers, algorithms, protocols, and also adapting dynamically to uh, different changes in cryptographic policies. Um, everything, or we are building everything with, with the aim of having the user um, do these changes seamlessly without actually having to redeploy applications. Uh, and we believe that actually this is uh, real cryptographic agility because we're we are going to be able to adjust, fix, and also remediate some of these 
findings uh, without the necessity to actually disrupt the service offered by, by some of these enterprise-grade applications. Um, some yeah. of these model, oh, go, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say that that seems to be like that. that's really key for, for a lot of customers. You know, it, it doesn't even matter what kind of company they are and what kind of business you're in, being able to fix these things without stopping what you're doing, without business interruption, um, that, that that's really a huge value. Yeah, indeed. And uh, and then depending on the customer and depending on the use case, um, it could be extremely important to, to take into account this, uh, this requirement of being able to do this without having to redeploy. Um, what I was going to, to, to say is that um, we're building a suite of remediation modules within the security suite because actually the range of use cases that we can cover when or, or that we can think about when when we want to actually fix cryptographic findings it, it, it's pretty wide and and we need to start with some of them and we're we we have chosen a set of use cases that we are that we are working on and that we will keep expanding as, as time comes but but the idea is that we'll we will be uh, be able to offer some of these uh, remediation modules uh, for specific use cases. Uh, and we're, we're going to be able to do that already in, in 2023 this year. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, and Graham, kind of, do you see it the, the same way, the, the value of uh, crypto agility and, and from, from what you're seeing from, from customers, how are they approaching um, that transition from the inventory to, to the remediation and how they see the, the value of, of the two different components. Well, it's absolutely true that nobody wants to keep changing their cryptography manually, right? I mean, it's a really heavy lift to, to get inside code, get inside configurations, uh, get inside file systems and change things all the time. So all of our customers that we're working with are looking at this, uh, this change, so this inventory and then this kind of migration to more modern cryptography as the opportunity to put in place the mechanisms that will keep them crypto agile in the future, right? So we all know that the large scale quantum computer is somewhere down the road. And when that comes along, that's going to break our public key cryptography. And even before that happens, our regulators, if we're in regulated sectors, are going to be like tapping on our shoulders and saying, look, wait, where, where are you, you know, getting your migration ready? Where are you starting to protect customer data with, with post quantum cryptography? And so what we want to do here is put in place those mechanisms that will enable us to choose the cryptography we want where we want according to our policy, right? So, so typically we might want to say, when I'm communicating outside the perimeter uh, of my data center, then I already want to start using PQC. And, and then, you know, maybe later on, I'm going to phase it in on internal or whatever it is. But what I don't want to do is have to manually figure all that out every time the policy changes, you know, from year to year as, as the situation evolves. So what we're putting in place here with the remediation modules that, that Mark described is, is a strategy to take care of that problem for you, not just now, but going into the future, right? So, so once you've got that visibility and control, you've also got that possibility to remediate as and when your policy evolves as, as we move forward. Yeah, and, and you touched on something uh, that I think is, is very important, which is the fact that, you know, crypto agility is something that it certainly enables migration to post quantum cryptography. So for customers that are interested uh, in uh, quantum and that are watching uh, the, the, the advances in, in quantum computing and maybe being a little bit concerned about that. Uh, this is certainly a, a topic that, that is of interest to them, uh, but it sounds like there's a lot more to it. This isn't just something that you do if you're worried about quantum computers. Crypto agility is, is something that you should be doing regardless, so just for better uh, cryptography management. Yeah, I think you get immediate benefits from that, right? So, so if I think about some of the customer cases we have, so we're currently rolling out the discovery and, and control center parts of the suite uh, with some extremely large uh, global financial services organizations. And they're looking for the first time to build an enterprise scale process to keep a continuously updated cryptography inventory, right? So everything from, from A to Z, uh, endpoints, servers, uh, network traffic, everything. This, this is very, very exciting for us because it's really the first time that, that this has been done in this kind of this kind of way. So continually uh, updated and, and visible. So they're 
they're of course concerned about quantum of course their regulator is, is concerned about quantum but they're seeing immediate benefits in terms of reducing operational risks for example around uh let's say lost or orphan certificates that are not in their certificate management system or reducing non-compliance risks right as, as compliance uh, requirements get more and more stringent about being able to not just say that i use encryption on my customers pii but be able to show my auditor like this is where i'm using encryption to protect my customer pii as those requirements get stronger there's a huge value in an asset that can just demonstrate that compliance when you need it without having to stop business or take people off other more value creating tasks to, to do that so you're actually getting a huge value from this from this asset from this cybersecurity asset the, the, the continuously updated inventory even before you start thinking about how you're going to do your your post quantum migration but then it's a it's a massive asset for that right in terms of prioritization quantum risk assessment figuring out the um, cryptographic dependencies between different parts of the system, like what it would actually look like. We have some customers running uh, processes to kind of score where they where it would make more impact to be able to start doing this work. It's a really, really powerful asset for that uh, as well. So yeah, we're definitely seeing that this is a project that has both immediate benefits and a really, and solves a really tricky long-term problem, right? Which is how are you gonna deal with this new situation where your cryptography ha has to change and may have to change again uh, as we move into these these PQC algorithms. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. And, and I know both of you have worked quite extensively with, with different types of, of customers, uh, some of them starting this process completely from scratch, some of them had uh, already put some some thought into how to better manage cryptography and, and hitting some challenges. So I'm kind of interesting, uh, interested in hearing from both of you, what are some of the uh, customer use cases that you're seeing? What what types of customers are, are really starting to do this and, and, and using uh, the, the, the product to, to do this? Maybe, maybe Mark, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I would say that uh, in principle, every single organization that is using cryptography, which is the majority, or if, if not all, should be concerned about modernizing cryptographic management because eventually, um, there are always going to be vulnerabilities found or migrations to be made from different algorithms that we're using nowadays to future algorithms that are currently being standardized in the case of PQC. But uh, there is also a wide range of other sorts of reasons uh, in terms of specific vulnerabilities that are found in cryptographic libraries, et cetera, et cetera, that are usually very hard to, to tackle when, when you don't have such an automation in place in, in your organization. So I would say that uh, first, all organizations should at least uh, have a peak of interest in, in this topic. But second, um, if, our, if an organization uh, is dealing with sensitive data that is going to continue being sensitive in the next several decades, uh, I would say that they should be the ones that should be leading uh, the, the adoption of this kind of of um, solutions because uh, at the end, uh, we are of course concerned about the quantum threat, which we kind of briefly referred before. Uh, there is uh, the, a quantum computer threat kind of looming in, in the horizon. And if at some point uh, powerful enough uh, quantum computer is built, uh, an attacker could, could decrypt data that could be recorded nowadays. So if we think that this data that we're sending over the wire nowadays encrypted with our current uh, public key cryptography um, could be sensitive in a few decades from now, then I think that that's a really strong reason to start looking at, at some of these products that, um, that are uh, out there and the, especially the one that we are building because offers a kind of an end-to-end -end vision to, to the overall problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What about you, Graham? Do you, do you see the same thing? Yeah, in fact, I'm just going to put in a, a, an extra kind of uh, level of granularity to that. So, so Mark's absolutely right. It's, it's exactly that kind of profile of organization where we're seeing uh, leadership and, and kind of initiative being taken to, to move forward on that. So a particular sector where we've been fortunate enough to, to start to roll out significant uh, deployments is in, is in the US federal government sector. 
uh, without going into specifics, but it is well known and, and public that there are requirements uh, coming direct into uh, presidential memos, at least to get the cryptography inventory part of the, uh, of the preparation for PQC done, uh, but also to experiment with real PQC algorithms in, in production environments and, and see what that looks like. And so some of our recent uh, pilots and, and uh, now moving up to scaled rollouts have, have been directly triggered by this kind of sensitivity. So although we are tackling the whole of the cryptography management problem, even for organizations for whom the quantum uh, transition is some way down the road, we are also seeing uh, a, a quite a, a rapid pickup uh, that's directly motivated by the idea that we need to start doing this work right now if we're gonna get PQC algorithms in place uh, in a timely manner to start protecting our data. Yeah, so so kind of different reasons to get started, but but it does mean that there's two different organizations of different types that are already starting to use these features and already starting to to do that. At least the inventory uh, part of of the process to identify where they're vulnerable and then do that prioritization to figure out how much more are they going to have to be compliant or to be ready for quantum computers. Yeah, Great. so I think one um, of the most exciting things is the is the integration that we're doing to make that uh, really scale, right? So, so, yeah. so definitely we want to get those inventories in place, but the challenge of getting that visibility on a few endpoints versus the challenge of actually making that work in a real enterprise environment with all the restrictions around the way we can transfer data and the unwillingness to run any kind of new agents and and the uh, other kind of restrictions around the way that we pick up data, whether it might contain kind of production uh, data inside an encryption operation, all that kind of stuff. Some of the most exciting work we've done recently has been solving those problems together with our customers uh, to really enable that thing to scale. So that, that's, what's, uh, that's what's keeping us really excited on the inventory side. Yeah, well, the, 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 that's really great. I mean, that's why we uh, we launched our security suite, right? Just just recently. Um, and actually, I'm pretty sure the audience is, is curious to, to see what that looks like. So Graham, maybe you can, um, you know, walk us through, through a quick demo. Uh, and while you get set up to, to do that, just a reminder um, to enter your questions, uh, if you have questions about anything that's that's been said, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take as many as we can right after uh, Graham's demo. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really just going to do like a, a really short uh, and simple demo here today. If we get enough, um, let's say if we get enough questions or, or feedback in the chat that there's there's kind of appetite out there to, to go deeper, then we'll perhaps reserve uh, a future session aside to, to really kind of go into to all the details of that. But let me just show off the, the way that we can go from a really high level view of an entire organization's inventory uh, down to uh, an issue that needs fixed, it uh, needs to be fixed and find the remediation for that issue uh, and really kind of take action on that. So here we're looking at the top level view for an org and we're seeing the different angles of view that we can have on the inventory. And we've got a kind of overall score of how much of our cryptography is passing our cryptographic rules. So I should say that though uh, we do suggest a kind of uh, recommended policy for cryptography, it's always up to our users to define for themselves exactly what that cryptography policy is, right? So we have a kind of palette of rules that we can choose from for different compliance regimes for whether we're more oriented towards preparing for post-quantum or whether we're trying to just pick out uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so we're really, the scores that we're getting are always about our customer's policy and where uh, that uh, coincides or, or doesn't with the cryptography that we're seeing on the ground. I've just got a very quick overview there of the inventory of the different kind of things that we can see, key stores, keys, algorithms, and so on. And then we can drop down from this very uh, high level view through to priority issues that need uh, fixing based on scoring that we've uh, combining both customer input and our own scoring things that need to be done. Uh, so I'm just going to dive down to see what that one of those looks like. So here we've got an issue around a, uh, a key transport key. So a key transport key is one that encrypts another one that's sent to another part of the, of the infrastructure uh, uh, that is outside a crypto period. So this is an example of something that is Nothing really to do with post-quantum, but actually a real problem today uh, because this could potentially lead us to fail uh, an audit uh, because of its possibility to compromise data. So for any of these kinds of, of rules, if they've been selected in the profile, we've also got a, a summary of why it is that this rule is there, like what, what NIST reference leads to this uh, requirement. Uh, and we can even set the, the key rotation period, right? That's part of the customization of our profile. We can say, okay, in this application, I want the key rotation period to be you know, one year or whatever it is. 
So we know that we've got a, a key that hasn't been rotated, uh, what we call a stale key. And we want to figure out, okay, how do we actually get that uh, fixed? So I can, I can click through to one of these uh, keys. And here I actually get references for the remediation, right? So, so how I would rotate this cloud-based key, in this case, it's an Azure key. Uh, I've got a, a reference I can give to my uh, operations people or to my developer to, to go ahead and fix that. Uh, and if I want to know what the key actually is, so one of the things that we get in our application view is the full life cycle of the use of the key during the running time of the application, right? So we, for, this, for this particular key, we can see everything that was done with it uh, by this piece of code. And so if you want to see what key it was, we can just go ahead uh, and dive into one of those uh, operations. Uh, and we've actually got the, the key level view here, right? So for every key that this application uses, we've got the details of it. Uh, and that includes uh, all of its parameters that are going to allow us to do uh, the remediation uh, that we need. So that's just a very, very quick uh, top to bottom dive from, from a, an overall level view, applying the profiles of the policy, the, the usage rules that we've set for, for our particular uh, set of cryptographic uh, rules, uh, and then diving all the way down to the bottom to see what information we can uh, export uh, to, to get that fixed. I should say we have a whole bunch of operations for exporting. We can tag into Jira, we can tag into GitHub, we basically send the issue wherever it needs to go to get it remediated uh, as soon as, as possible. And all of that uh, has recently, as part of our work with our larger customers, been automated into the API workflow, right? So that we can set up rules to make sure that particular kinds of issues get automatically tagged in, in the right places. All right, that's, that's it. So it's just a little teaser for today. But as I said, if there's enough interest uh, in the chat and in Q&A, then, we'll, then we'll set up a, a full demo, and maybe uh, make it interactive and let people uh, dive a little bit uh, deeper into that. Yeah, the, the, that's amazing. And so just a, I guess a quick question about um, that workflow. Is, is that a typical use case that, that you walked us through, kind of starting with that you know, inventory, then setting policies, and then kind of doing that triage and, and prioritization um, work before moving on to remediation. Yeah, so, so what you saw there was the, the kind of, it was already there, the data, right? So, so a big part of the, the work that we do to get the inventory at scale is integrating our, our data collectors, which are application tracers, file system scanners, uh, network capture uh, uh, nodes integrating that at scale across the enterprise using uh, existing tools so things like ci pipelines or endpoint managers you know we always try to avoid requiring our customer to deploy anything new right so we, we're going to leverage the, the tools and processes they already have in place doing other kinds of observability uh, to add this cryptographic observability capability to to, to come in on that. Uh, so once we have that and we're in the situation that you saw there uh, in the view so that's the, the kind of web interface way of playing things. So we, we can we can set all that up with different user groups, with different permissions, who can access different parts of the application suite to make sure that the information is contained on a kind of need to know basis and that they can do their work there. But frequently what we see is people setting up automated API workflows, for example, within CI. So without even leaving, let's say their GitHub environment, our user can, uh, can, can make a code change, trigger a build, build triggers a new cryptographic finding which they see right there in their their github environment and it shows them exactly what they need to do to fix it and they can trigger the build again and they actually never come into our ui right so the only people who are in the ui are the cryptography and policy and operations team who are setting this up and getting it integrated and we don't interrupt the the developer's workflow they just see uh, an issue, come, issue comes in the remediation comes in the, the justification comes in and, and they fix it check in again and, and move on so that that's really what we're what we're aiming for here is, is, is self-serve cryptographic compliance in a kind of DevOps environment. And that's where the, the, the kind of productivity of that really, really comes in. So moving on from that, what we're building, as Mark has already mentioned, is, is automated remediation, right? So, so we're not even uh, interrupting or triggering the developer's uh, workflow to say, to say fix the code. We're actually abstracting that cryptography out as we deploy our remediation modules so that in future, uh, the cryptography policy team can, can make changes without requiring the developers to, to recompile or rewrite code. Uh, so that part of the suite is in a kind of partner program phase at the moment. So we're working with select partners, some of whom are already large users of the, the inventory technology, but not all, uh, to get those uh, deployments working in real enterprise use cases where there, there is uh, momentum right now to modernize applications, right? For, for more reasons than just cryptography, but cryptography is definitely one of the strong drivers. And integrating into those modernization programs uh, to get the remediation modules in there 
uh, so that in the future we'll be able to remediate those issues without the developer even having to break stride. Yeah, no, that, that that's great. Mark, is there anything you want to add about uh, the the modernization and, and kind of our strategy for supporting customers uh, with that? Um, yeah, um, I think Graham gave a, a good overview on this. Uh, what I would maybe add is that um, what we're seeing uh, from from our uh, experience at Sandbox AQ is that it's extremely helpful to start working on the inventory piece first. Um, as Graham mentioned, due to the fact that there has been almost no progress uh, there in, in, in a couple of decades and that all we have so far are some standalone tools that tackle parts of the overall picture. Um, it, it takes time to understand uh, how um, these could benefit uh, an organization in, at, uh, at a large scale within a given infrastructure and how to integrate these with um, every single piece that is important to take into account. So we, we're working on that. Uh, and then while working on that, what, um, what we suggest, which is extremely valuable, is to also start having the discussions on what are the most critical use cases to take into account from a remediation standpoint. Because as I mentioned earlier, there could be a wide variety of uh, scenarios here to consider. Uh, and there are certain scenarios from, from our point of view that are definitely much more critical to, to have a look at and, and to try to remediate via uh, the automated tools that, that we are building. So this is this is what, what I would add on, on top of this. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, so I see we have lots of questions coming in, so maybe let's start taking a few. Um, the first question is, does your tool migrate customers to the four approved NIST QRC algorithms? Um, so Mark, maybe I'll hand that one off to you since uh, you're quite familiar with, with the NIST process. <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely. So actually, um, one of the main uh, capabilities of this end-to-end -end security suite is to be able to seamlessly migrate cryptographic algorithms within, within a given infrastructure via the remediation suite of modules. Uh, right now, we, we in, in, in the current version that we have, we're considering the four uh, already selected algorithms uh, by, by NIST. Um, from from which NIST is actually uh, actively writing the the final standard documents, um, and they are available to to the customers via uh, their integration into the protocols that that we are uh, used nowadays to to use for secure communications like TLS, for instance. Uh, but definitely, the, the the answer is that yes, uh, it's 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 one of the main capabilities of of the of the security suite. And as soon as there are additional algorithms um, that are standardized, because, um, for instance, NIST is opening a new whole uh, standardization process for additional digital signature algorithms, which will give us additional standards in several years from now, all these algorithms will be available to, to, to the customers via the remediation modules in a seamless manner uh, without the necessity to, to redeploy. So. That's the that's the idea here. Great. Um, so let me move on to another question. I really like this one, actually. Um, how do you assess the value of security provision at any point during the continuing and automated process? Uh, meaning, how do I know what my level of security is at any point in time since it's constantly changing? Um, so I think this is a great question because obviously we know that security is not something that's point in time and it should be something that that's continuous. I know Graham, you, you've, you've talked about this uh, quite a bit in, in the past. Uh, maybe we want to take a stab at an answer. Yeah, it is super, super interesting question. So, so one of the interesting things about the way that we're deploying our inventory tooling now is that we're, we're not doing a kind of one-off assessment like let's make a catalog of, of the cryptography in 2023 and then you know, maybe come back to it later. We're putting in place processes that can give a continuous up-to-date view of the cryptography posture of the organization, we could say. 
uh, at any time. Uh, and one of the uh, things that we're seeing uh, from our, our users is that they quite like the idea of being able to track how that evolves over time, right? So I should say that the security suite doesn't maintain an archive of all of your results for you know for years and years, uh, but it's very easy using our API to, as it's a GraphQL API, so it's very easy to customize the way that you pull uh, data out of it. And I should say that all of the data tables that we have in there are accessible through the GraphQL API. So, so we don't lock up your data, right? So your inventory is there. It's designed to be there in a way that will maximize the ways that you can integrate it into your, your enterprise workflows. One of the ways that people are doing that is designing a query to that API that feeds out a summary of what their cryptographic security posture is right now. And then setting up a process to feed that into to a data tracking tool uh, so that they can monitor that over time. So if they can uh, see how it improves, how it evolves, uh, what happened when we added some new functionalities or network segments or applications or, or whatever it was. And uh, so, yeah, that's a, we, we can't, you know, kind of solve the entire problem for you for your security posture, but we can at least add to your data about your security posture, uh, an accurate and up-to-date view of, of exactly what you had in terms of cryptography and in terms of that cryptography's compliance and security at, at any point in time. Yeah. Mark, anything to add? Um, no, I think that that was a complete, a quite complete answer, yes. Great. Um, so we have another question here about um, certificate management. Um, so the question is for SSH certificates. Um, can our product also uh, manage these certificates and manage server certificates and their key management? Um, I don't one of you. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can go on that one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. So, so we um, can see uh, SSH certificates uh, when we find them. That is to say, when we find them uh, on file systems, and we can report those uh, in the inventory. We don't, at the moment, have a, a management functionality for them like we have for, say, uh, standard X509 certificates. So, the way that we uh, deal with certificates that we find that are, for example, uh, uh, out of expiry date or, or not valid or issued by the wrong kind of uh, um, issue or whatever it is, is that we integrate with whatever tool your enterprise is, is using right now for certificate management. So for example, one of our public integrations is with uh, Venify. Uh, and with the Venify platform, when we find a whole bunch of certificates, so this is after scanning every file system in your, in your organization, for example, is we can reconcile those against your, uh, your certificate inventory that you have and figure out where you have orphan certificates uh, or where you have ones that you thought were in your inventory but actually don't exist anywhere or maybe they've been copied to the wrong place and they don't match up with the right part of the network infrastructure and we can actually take remediation action there right so we can actually call uh, the venify uh, inventory for example and say uh, please add these certificates that we found and then put them under management so with ssa certificates uh, so we can't do that right now right so we can see them and tell you about them uh, but we don't currently have an interface to to a management tool. But if the person who has asked that question um, it, it's got a kind of uh, interesting use case around that, uh, yeah, I definitely like reach out to us afterwards, and I'd definitely be interested to hear more about how your what issues you're seeing there and how you're managing them. Right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe um, here I what, what I would add is that we we had some situations in which um, by using our inventory solution we we could detect actually that there there were some certificates that were tracked by uh, the enterprise deployed solutions, and that actually those same certificates were also present in other areas of the organization, but were not being tracked by these by these solutions. Um, and then we were able to actually give uh, a, a more complete view, uh, 360 kind of degrees view of actually where is that certificate present across the entire infrastructure and, and help that external third party tool consolidate this, this information. So these are a good use case where we actually integrate well with, with these existing uh, kind of specific solutions that are already out there. All right, great. Thank you both. Um, there's a potentially related uh, question about uh, how do we support customers for both on-prem uh, as well as cloud? Um, 
Not sure who wants to to take a shot at that one first. You can take it um, first, can... uh, Dig, okay. if you like. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll grab it, Mark. Thanks. So the the there are a lot of commonalities in what we deploy, whether you're uh, in cloud or on prem, right? So so first of all, the the management tool, the the main control center, and all of the analysis that's there, and the databases and so on. Uh, we have versions of that that you can deploy uh, in your own cloud, uh, that you can deploy on prem. Uh, or you can even uh, use it on our uh, managed SaaS. And in all those cases, you get uh, you know, horizontal scalability, you can uh, have a, a way that you can run it in high availability. And so, so we can we can fix into any of those uh, kind of deployment scenarios. That's for the management platform. But if your applications or infrastructure are uh, in the cloud, then actually a lot of our components are the same. Some of the deployment routes can be a little bit different in the sense that we can leverage uh, cloud APIs to maybe uh, scale up in, in slightly different ways. But the core uh, visibility tools that we have uh, actually work in exactly the same way, uh, whether your applications are running uh, on the cloud or, or on prem. Yeah, uh, what I was going to, to say is what Graham already commented, so nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> great. That means it was a great answer. Um, uh, another question we have is, since each company has a different system implementation and structure, how does the control interface um, avoid being, well, is it more a one size fit all or is it more customized? Um, so how, how is the control center implemented for each organization? Right, so, so there's definitely a customization uh, around the cryptography policy. Right. So, so essentially, every organization has uh, nuances in the kinds of ciphers, cipher modes, key lengths, uh, hash functions, uh, whatever it is that, that, that they allow. Uh, and pretty much every large financial services organization, for example, has a cryptography policy of, of some level of detail that's revised every year that has a lot of these, these nuances in. So part of the work, particularly when we go to scale, uh, is helping our uh, customer uh, choose the right options in our palette of cryptographic policy rules to correspond to their uh, profile. So there's definitely a customization around that. But in terms of just deploying the control center, we, we're, we're very careful to use only kind of very standard uh, components for that, which uh, allows us to fit into to pretty much anybody's infrastructure. Uh, so there isn't any uh, customization or kind of uh, integration or re-implementation that has to be done to, to get that up. Great, thank you. Um, see, so many good ones to pick from. Um, yes. uh, here's a good one from Mark. Um, I'm working in an organization that doesn't support new agent installation, uh, or if it does, it takes a long time to approve. Is there an agentless version of the modules? Or is it possible to integrate with third parties to avoid new agent installation? Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe uh, Graham, I can take first this one. Um, so uh, it, it, that's a that's a good question because it actually reflects uh, the, the the real world when, when it comes to deploying new software uh, at large scale in an organization. It's not easy to deploy a new agent. Uh, Usually, endpoints uh, have already a lot of agents running uh, in an in an enterprise setting, um, and therefore uh, we we are taking different strategies here. Of course, we can deploy our own agent, but we also offer the possibility to integrate with third-party applications that are already uh, present in in the different endpoints that an organization can have. Um, and this means that, for instance, we can integrate with uh, third-party tools like Tanium uh, in order to, to leverage the presence that these might already have across a given infrastructure. So the, the, the response is that we, we do offer um, an alternative and a solution for those customers that cannot definitely allow a single agent more to be, to be installed. Great. Yeah, I mean, I know this is uh, when I was doing cybersecurity, even even before doing quantum, that was always the 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 the, the challenge to to try to implement new agents in an organization is is always a 
an uphill battle. So um, it's it's great that we're able to do it without um, you know, we have options to avoid that. Just to add one more uh, to the list there for, from, from, from Mark's answer. So for, for example, in, in, when we're looking at file system scanning, so again, we can do that by actually running an executable within, uh, you know, a kind of a long running uh, virtual machine and, and doing the scan in there. Uh, but we can also scan from the outside, right, without having to have that agent running in there. So for example, a good integration point uh, is uh, scanning container images in a, in a container delivery pipeline for when we're delivering uh, containerized applications. Uh, that's a nice place where we can integrate into a CI CD chain. Uh, no extra agents have to run on any uh, production uh, machines, but just before we deploy that container, we have that as a kind of final guardrail to scan uh, every file that's on there, look into all of those files to see if there's any cryptographic artifacts and check that all of those are in policy and correspond to what we're supposed to be deploying. Uh, so we get that uh, visibility and we get that check, uh, but without having to run any agent on the production side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. We have another question about applications. Um, so the question is, are we able to do inventory of IoT devices uh, in their certificates? That's a good one. Um, so we, we're we currently not supporting IoT uh, in, in a general setting as such. Uh, via the, the network uh, traffic anal uh, analyzer module within the inventory, there are certain things that end up popping up in the cryptographic inventory that are related to IoT devices that at the end are part of a given enterprise organization. Um, so there are certain things that we end up categorizing that, um, that are part of, of that, but there are a lot of other things that we still haven't, haven't considered. Uh, so again, if um, this person would like to uh, get in touch and give us a bit more details about some of the specific use cases that they're thinking about, we would be really happy to, to kind of listen to, to the requirements. Yes. Right, very good. Um, did we have a question about um, binaries? Um, so are we able to scan, scan binaries, including firmware and also hardware scan, scanning, such as HSMs? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll grab that one. So, so on hardware security modules, yeah, we do actually have uh, some quite interesting capabilities there. Uh, so, so one of them is that we're able to scan uh, an HSM. Uh, and get the inventory of the available cryptography as well as any sort of non-compliances about the way that it's uh, been uh, configured, including the protection of the keys inside the HSM. Uh, and we can also watch the way that an HSM is used by an application. So I talked about how our application visibility allows us to see every time an application calls a cryptographic library. That includes when they call cryptographic hardware through through the driver, right, through the, the equivalent of the library. So every time an application uses an HSM, essentially, we're, we're gonna get visibility on that and see what keys were used and how those keys were protected and then whether that usage was was compliant with that policy. So we have pretty nice uh, visibility there. In terms of uh, scanning uh, a binary, like a firmware, so no, that's not something that's in the current capability, although we do have some interesting R&D uh, that we'll probably talk about another time uh, mm -hmm. uh, around, that, uh, around that area. But the, the, a lot of those uh, scenarios where we only have a binary, we can still run the application tracer. So I should mention that the way that we trace applications doesn't require them to be recompiled, right? So, so even uh, third-party code that we don't have the source, party, the source code for, if it's using uh, standard cryptographic libraries, uh, then we can still get visibility on the way that it's using those libraries, even without recompiling the code. So, so in some cases, we actually don't need to, to scan the binary itself. So. Mark, anything to add? Um, no, if at some point we, we do another run of these things, talking about some of the R&D activities that we have, as Graham mentioned, then maybe we can give a bit more details. But definitely there are some interesting ideas uh, going on, on on this direction in the team. Yeah, great. Um, I don't know if you have time for, for one uh, more question. Maybe I'll I'll just ask you guys one 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 more question. 
um, how for for customers that are listening to this and 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 are very interested in in this topic, what what do you recommend as a as a next step? Well, there's uh, the the two sides. If you if you think that you might be interested in in uh, working out how you can do your own cryptography uh, inventory, so so you, you you're already kind of looking at that. Then you know, of course, we have a, a, a sales team who would love to to get on on a call with you and, and show you a detailed demo and talk about that. Uh, but if it's still a little early for you, like you're not quite sure whether we have a real need in our organization for a cryptography inventory, there are actually some really um, interesting white papers that we have about this that have been researched in, in collaboration with various. Uh, collaborators in the university we have very very strong links to to top uh, research organizations around the cryptography topics so you can learn a bunch uh, more stuff there without even engaging with any salespeople if you just want to kind of figure out whether this might be uh, something useful for you and beyond the kind of commercial uh, engagement around uh, licensing the tool and building your own cryptography inventory as i mentioned we've got a, a small number uh, of opportunities for people to to join the the, the partner program around the remediation solution uh, so there we're really looking for people who are looking at ways they're going to deploy agile, modern cryptography, including PQC, uh, and are prepared to work with us in the short term in, in a kind of good uh, uh, like partner, equal partner collaboration uh, agreement uh, to get access to those uh, solutions that are very early and influence our roadmap. And uh, so that might be an exciting opportunity if your if your organization is already looking at how they're going to get that done uh, over the next uh, 12 months or so. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, what about you, Mark? Do you want to say just a, a few words? I think it would be good for you to also touch on uh, the fact that we're doing cryptography research and, and we are contributing to, to standards and their implementation and so on. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. So, um... Just adding on what Graham mentioned, uh, from an engineering point of view, we love getting into early conversations uh, with customers in order to to realize and, and identify what are important scenarios that they that they care of. Um, and on the remediation side, uh, that's actually something that we would love to have. So if you're thinking about some some specific use cases where this would be critical for you. Um, we would be extremely happy to actually have this conversation. Um, and then on, on what uh, Nadia mentioned, uh, so we have a really strong uh, R&D team within within the, the engineering uh, group. Um, and we do a cryptographic research. We are um, working on a cryptographic uh, algorithms, new cryptographic algorithms. We have a new digital signature scheme that has been published and presented at Eurocrypt uh, last month. Um, but we also focus on on how these uh, new quantum resistant algorithms can end up uh, impacting I impacting secure communication protocols like, like TLS. So we have actually a really interesting piece uh, on uh, TLS and um, a proposal on how to actually have the latency of, of TLS connections in specific scenarios. Uh, and then um, at, the, at the same time, we also do care a lot about the privacy aspects um, of, of, our digital, of our digital communications. And we have a really strong team as well working on privacy enhancing technologies. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. And we have a lot of the, the papers and, and some technical blogs on our website as well. So that, that's a good place um, to, to, to start if you're interested in some of the research that Mark and, and his team is, is doing. Um, so we're at time. Thank you so much for, for attending. Uh, we will send out an email after this webinar and that will include the recording of the webinar in case you want to watch it again or send the link to, to one of your colleagues. Uh, you can also send us an, an email uh, if you would like uh, a personal demo. I, I've seen a few uh, requests already come in for a more in-depth uh, demo of what Graham showed, and we're, we would be happy to do that. So just contact us if you would like a demo. Uh, and thanks again for joining. And thank you, Nadia, for, for moderating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all.